Hi, I'm Olivia padovan Marhar, and in this slidecast I will be talking about our findings concerning transcriptional regulation in mammalian cells. In particular, I will be discussing transcriptional mechanisms cells have in place to allow RNA concentration to remain relatively constant in individual cells, regardless of cell size or cell cycle stage. We recently published this work in Molecular Cell. Let me begin by framing the problem. Suppose you have two genetically identical cells, but one is small and one is large. Both of these cells have a nucleus, and within the nucleus, each cell has the same amount of DNA. For the sake of clarity, let's focus on one particular gene. Holding all else constant, you may expect that one copy of a gene will produce the same amount of RNA regardless of the size of cell that it is in. In this case, you would end up with a much higher concentration of RNA in the small cell than in the large cell. This could lead to problems for cellular function, especially if this gene is particularly important for the proper functioning of the cell. Most biological processes that happen within a cell can essentially be thought of as chemical reactions and therefore are dependent on the concentration of biomolecules rather than the absolute number. If then, one cell has a higher concentration of RNA than another, it is likely that the two cells will function differently. In order to maintain proper cellular function, it would be beneficial for cells to maintain RNA at a relatively constant concentration. To see if cells do, in fact, maintain RNA at a relatively constant concentration, we needed to measure both RNA and volume in single cells at the same time. We did this using RNA fluorescence in situ hybridization, or RNA fish. In this method, we designed several oligonucleotide probes to be complementary to our RNA of interest, each labeled with a single fluorophore. After performing RNA fish, individual RNA molecules appear as bright fluorescent spots in the microscope, as shown here. For more details on the RNA fish assay, please see Arjun's 2008 Nature Methods paper. Using the RNA fish technique, we can detect RNA spots in three dimensions, and we took advantage of this to use RNA fish to measure the volume of single cells. By imaging RNA from a highly abundant gene in three dimensions, and then essentially draping a sheet over the top of the points, we obtain an outline or shell of the cell. We then integrate under that shell to obtain the volume. Because we can image multiple colors in the same sample, we can use this method to simultaneously measure cell volume and the abundance of our RNA of interest. We observe, as we had suspected, that RNA abundance scales with volume. Larger cells have more RNA than smaller cells. Here you can see data from three different genes with three different mean abundance levels. The RNA from all of these genes scales with volume, suggesting that this is a global phenomenon and not just the case for highly abundant RNAs. Now we have shown that larger cells have more RNA than smaller cells, so there must be something different between large cells and small cells. It could be that larger cells produce RNA at a faster rate, or alternatively, it could be that larger cells degrade RNA at a slower rate. Each of these hypotheses leads to a prediction for what RNA degradation rate and RNA production rate would look like as a function of cell size. We measured these two quantities, and found that our data was much more consistent with the hypothesis that larger cells produce RNA at a faster rate. We thus sought to classify this transcriptional mechanism further. To impose directionality on our observed correlation between cell size and RNA abundance, we asked the question, does changing cell size change RNA abundance? Unfortunately, there is no simple way to add volume to a cell, so we relied on a cell fusion experiment. We began with two cell lines. One consisted of small cells stably expressing GFP RNA at relatively constant concentration, and the other consisted of larger cells that did not express GFP. We fused these cells together to create heterokaryons, which are cells with two nuclei, only one of which contained the GFP gene. By then looking at GFP RNA, we could see the effect of adding extra volume to the one nucleus containing the GFP gene. We found that the fused cells did, in fact, express GFP RNA at higher levels than unfused cells, showing for the first time that adding volume to a cell causes an increase in RNA production. By looking at the concentration of GFP RNA in the fused cells, we could distinguish between models of the mechanism that transmits cell size information to the DNA. It could be that size information is transmitted through a volume sensor, which would be a molecule that somehow knows the size of the cell and transmits that information to the DNA. Here, the volume sensor would tell a larger cell to make more RNA and a smaller cell to make less RNA. In this case, we would expect the concentration of GFP RNA in the fused cell to be the same as the concentration of the unfused cells because the volume sensor would communicate the total size of the cell to both nuclei indiscriminately. In this case, the fit line between GFP RNA and volume for the unfused cells should also fit the data for the fused cells. In other words, the concentration of GFP RNA should remain the same after adding more volume.
Alternatively, size information could be transmitted by sequestration or titration of a general factor required for transcription, such as RNA polymerase. If this factor is expressed proportional to volume, there will be a higher overall amount of the factor in a larger cell than a smaller cell. The factor is localized to the nucleus, so the concentration of the factor in the nucleus will be higher in larger cells. Because the factor is required for transcription, the higher concentration in the nucleus will lead to more transcription in larger cells. In such a model, the factor senses both cell size and DNA content. What then would we predict to happen after we fuse the cells together? Upon fusion, the factor will be divided between the two nuclei, so each nucleus will only produce half as much RNA as it would if it was the sole nucleus in a cell of that size. In this scenario, therefore, we would expect the fused cells to have a GFP RNA concentration that is half of what it was in unfused cells. We measured GFP RNA in the fused cells and found that our data were much more consistent with the volume DNA sensor hypothesis. We have therefore shown that volume can dictate the overall level of transcription within a cell and that the transcriptional output is also dependent on the DNA content of the cell. We believe transcription scales with volume in this manner as the result of the titration of a general factor required for transcription, such as RNA polymerase. We have just discussed how it is possible for larger cells to produce more RNA from the same amount of DNA, but there is a second problem that cells need to address. Cells are not static. They progress through the cell cycle, during which they replicate their DNA in preparation for division. Therefore, it is possible to have two cells that are the same size, but one cell might have twice as much DNA as the other, a fact which we have observed experimentally. To think about how the cell solves these problems, we took a more detailed look at transcription. Note that transcription is not a steady process, but rather occurs in bursts. Genes can be on or off, and only when a gene is on does it produce RNA. We characterize this process in terms of burst size, or how much RNA is produced when a gene is on, and burst frequency, or how frequently a gene turns on. Either of these parameters can be modulated. So, for example, to produce twice as much RNA, a gene could either increase burst frequency to burst twice as frequently, or it could increase burst size and produce twice as much RNA per burst. We measured these parameters by looking at sites of active transcription within cells. When a gene is being actively transcribed, RNA piles up at the site of transcription, and we detect this as a bright spot in the microscope. Because all of our imaging was done in fixed cells, we could not look at a gene bursting in time. Instead, we measured transcription site intensity as a proxy for burst size and the fraction of actively transcribing genes per cell in place of burst frequency. We first measured transcription site intensity and frequency in cells of different sizes and found that burst size scaled with cell volume. We looked at four different genes, and in all cases, there was an increase in burst size in larger cells. We further measured transcription site frequency and noticed no clear trend with volume. Therefore, we concluded that larger cells are able to produce more RNA than small cells through modulation of burst size. Thus, we inferred that the volume DNA sensor we described previously modulated burst size, not frequency. We next addressed the question of how cells compensate for different amounts of DNA and found that burst frequency changes during the cell cycle. Before DNA replication, genes burst with a characteristic frequency per copy. After replication, the frequency per copy is reduced by a factor of two. But because there are twice as many copies after replication, the RNA output is the same as it was before replication. We further note that burst size does not change throughout the cell cycle, showing that cells compensate for differences in DNA content through modulation of burst frequency, not size. To sum it up, we have shown that cells modulate burst size to compensate for changes in volume and burst frequency to compensate for changes in DNA content. Both of these mechanisms allow cells to produce RNA at constant concentration despite changes in volume and DNA content. What might these mechanisms be molecularly? We believe, but do not conclusively claim, that RNA polymerase may be the volume DNA sensor that changes burst size as it satisfies all of the criteria necessary for such a factor. It is important for transcription. It is important, or it is expressed proportional to cell size, as shown here by RNA fish, and it is primarily localized to the nucleus. Further, we knocked down the amount of Pol2 in cells using tryptolide and saw a corresponding reduction in bright transcription sites. Therefore, changing the amount of Pol2 changes the burst size, much as changing cell volume does. We also showed that reducing Pol2 did not change burst frequency. For these reasons, we believe that Pol2 may be the volume DNA sensor we have described. What about the burst frequency mechanism that compensates for changes in DNA content? 
In principle, this mechanism could be the same as the volume DNA sensor that changes burst size. So why does the cell use a different mechanism here? The problem is one of transcriptional output during the progression through S phase when the DNA replicates. Suppose the black lines are genes and the orange dots are the volume DNA sensor. Before DNA replication, each gene gets some amount of the factor. After replication, each gene has half the amount of factor, which could lead to a reduction in burst size, just as if the cell's volume decreased by a factor of two. But this leads to a potential problem in S phase. When the DNA first starts to replicate, early replicating genes have two copies, while others only have one. When the factor is apportioned, it could cause excess trans transcription of genes that replicate early in S phase. The fact that burst frequency rather than burst size changed after replication hinted that perhaps the reason there is a different mechanism for compensation after replication is to help solve this problem. To see if this was the case, we measured transcription frequency in S phase for both an early and late replicating gene. We saw that the transcription frequency of the early replicating gene is reduced at the beginning of S phase, while the transcription frequency of the late replicating gene is not reduced until the end of S phase. We do not see any over-transcription of the early replicating gene in S phase. Therefore, we believe that the mechanism compensating for DNA content is independent of the volume DNA sensor and is instead a DNA-linked cis-acting factor that changes transcription frequency immediately upon replication of each gene. Such a factor may be a histone with a particular modification that is partitioned between copies upon replication. In conclusion, cells compensate for size by changing burst size through a trans factor that senses volume and DNA content, and cells compensate for changes in DNA content through the cell cycle through a cis-acting factor, thus ensuring appropriate transcription of RNA despite differences in cell size and DNA content. Finally, it is important to note that not all genes' RNA scales with volume. Some genes just have noisy expression. In collaboration with Abidai Singh from the University of Delaware, we came up with a metric called noise measure, or NM, that explains the amount of variability in RNA expression that cannot be accounted for by volume. To study noise in gene expression genome-wide, we performed single-cell RNA sequencing and calibrated our data such that we were able to extract RNA counts and volume for every gene in the genome for every cell we sequenced. Using this data, we found that cell type specific genes such as transcription factors and response genes tended to have higher noise levels in their RNA than genes that are ubiquitously expressed, such as housekeeping genes. To conclude, we now have a much better understanding of homeostatic mechanisms of transcriptional regulation within single cells. We show that when doing single cell measurements, it is critical to take cell volume into account in order to correctly interpret data, for instance, when measuring gene expression noise. Equally importantly, our heterokaryon experiments show that changes in volume can directly and globally change transcription, which is an important factor to consider when examining such global changes in transcription, as recently reported in tumors with elevated semic expression. Finally, there are many processes in nature, such as early embryogenesis, where rapid cell divisions occur, but total volume remains unchanged, thus exponentially increasing the ratio of DNA to volume. Our work provides a framework by which it is possible for the organism to maintain constant concentrations of RNA and protein despite these rapid cell divisions. One final practical consequence of this work is that we have shown that it is still okay to normalize data to GAPDH or other highly expressed genes. Thank you for taking the time to watch this slidecast.